Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, so it's, uh, it's my pleasure to host today Peter Rigby who is right now a PhD candidate at the University of Victoria. He's studying under um, Daniel German and uh, Peggy Story. Um, it's about to finish in a few months. Um, he actually is going to be, he's going to be talking today about peer review in open source software. He had an ICSI paper in 08 um, that examined this and then he also um, took it further and uh, actually has an upcoming ICSI paper in Hawaii in May. Um, so he's going to give us kind of a, everything he's learned about how open source peer review works. So with that introduction, here, here's Peter. Thanks. So um, yeah, the, uh, this is what I've studied for my dissertation, so peer review and open source. And uh, does anyone know where this quotation comes from? Computers are useless. They can only give you answers. Do you know who said that? Anyone? No. You got to think outside of the computer world, actually. Oh. Think Seattle yesterday, actually, or for the last couple of weeks. Seattle? Yesterday? For the last? I was like. <laughs> Maybe that's not helping. I, I, that doesn't help you, actually. Forget that. I have no clue. Yeah. yeah. It's Picasso, and there was the Picasso exhibit that, that, that was just in, in town. Picasso? Yeah. yeah. Holy cow. <laughs> Would never, ever in the have thought that. I don't know what Picasso would think of Connect, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, he would say Connect is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, yeah, the exhibit was, was pretty fantastic. That's, he's one sort of interesting fellow. <laughs> Anyways, back to, to the research. So, yeah, peer review and open source. Um, so uh, this was my dissertation work, um, which I'll be hopefully defending this term. But uh, these were the sort of the main steps of my research. So the first, I wanted, you know, I'll, I'll inspection and sort of peer review has been around for over 35 years now. Um, and while we have a good sort of understanding of it in uh, industrial development, there, and, and open source development claimed, you know, you, you know all eyeball, uh, many eyeball, any eyeballs make all bugs shallow. There was never really like any empirical stuff on you know how many people are actually involved. Is this actually efficient and this kind of stuff? So I tried to give sort of an empirical basis to some of the uh, claims that there's massive peer review in open source, for example. So I started off with uh, just looking at the different processes that successful software projects use. So I, I focused just on successful ones in this work, and just just at sort of a policy level, how do they conduct peer review? And then the next thing I did is I sort of started quantifying, um, quantifying various aspects of peer review. Uh, and for me, I just look at how they do it on the mailing list. So I think Tom's actually looked at it in Bugzilla and this kind of stuff. But for me, it's these, these broadcasts on the mailing list, as well as like post-commit reviews, where it's like posted after it's been committed, and, and then there's a review. So I have sort of statistical models of the efficiency and effectiveness of this and various parameters that I look at. Um, and while these numbers are interesting, they don't really give you an idea of, of, how, um, of how developers actually interact during the review, how they actually find within this sort of broadcast of patches and de development discussion the actual reviews that they're interested in reviewing, um, and how they deal with uh, things like Parkinson's Law, which says, you know, people discuss sort of trivial issues to death. And when you have lots and lots of potential people who can discuss stuff, do we sort of get overwhelmed and deadlock in this useless discussion, right? So how do they deal with these sort of interactions? So that last part sort of more qualitative. So first of all, why do people do peer review? And Weinberg noted that you know, when you're writing your own code, you just are just unaware, unable to see sort of these stupid little errors that you have. You see what you want to see as opposed to what's actually there. And then when you invite a peer to actually look at it, they're like, oh, well, the problem's obvious, you know? and they pick up your little errors. So that's sort of fundamentally what peer review is all about, getting someone else to look at your code. And there's all kinds of um, different techniques. And sort of the most formal one is, is formal inspection, which was sort of introduced by Michael Fagan at IBM about 35 years ago. Um, and it was very rigid and reg, reg, uh, 
regimented in the sense that there was a single goal and you didn't step outside of that goal. So you were finding defects and that was it. Um, you didn't discuss anything else during the inspection meetings. That all those kinds of discussions were cut off. And you had rigidly defined roles. So there was a moderator, a reader, a reviewer, these kinds of things. And it was typically done, what well, was done on large completed artifacts, right? So you finished something and then you gave it to these reviewers. They went away, looked at it, you came back and met and discussed in multiple meetings any issues that you had found. Um, <clears throat> sort of over time, that process has, well, there's also sort of walkthroughs that are less, sort of less formal. So there's been many sort of variations on that process that has made it less formal and sort of more amenable often to uh, developers who don't actually often enjoy doing these really formal reviews um, and often aren't engaged and, and therefore don't find as many defects. Uh, sort of at the other end of the formality spectrum is pair programming where you just have someone typing and someone looking over that person's shoulder. So. Uh, this is kind of continuous review, but there's no sort of third party that is, uh, that is also sort of checking what you're doing. Right? It's just the two of you that are going at it. Um, and then the open source. So when I looked at these 25 policies of these successful projects, what we saw is the important thing is, is the commit right here. So everything happens around the time of commit. Um, and you have these two different types. So you have review then commit, which is called um, RTC. And commit them review, which is CTR. So what happens in the case of review then commit is you say, I have this patch. Um, people come and they say, well, there's this particular problem with it, or do you think of this? And then there's rework done, and then it's committed. So it's before the commit. With commit then review, what happens is you have trusted individuals who are able to modify the shared repository. Um, they make a change, and then it, that change is is sent to the commit mailing list. And a lot of projects have a policy of everyone who's a committer has to read all the commits that, that go through on that list. And um, then if they find any problems, there's rework and then there's another commit. Or if it's a really significant problem, which happens you know, relatively rarely, it's re re reverted to the previous commit and then reworked, right? Um, the problem with the review then commit, so uh, there's different styles of review than commit, and sort of one style is a strong style where it doesn't, not even the trusted people are allowed to commit before it's reviewed. But the problem with that is it's kind of inefficient because I have to find someone to always review my code. Whereas most of the time, I'm, I'm changing these small, I'm doing a small fix and I have to wait, you know, for a day while people review it. And it's just slowing me down, right? Because everything happens around the commit. So certain projects like uh, MySQL use strong RTC. Um, another style is maintainer RTC, which basically happens when there is code ownership, so a project that's big enough that you do have sort of explicit code ownership. Before you can change this part of the system, you have to talk to the maintainer. But the part you own, you can change and do sort of the commit and review style. So there's a number of little variants within this, but those are the two main types of, of review. So um, I looked at 25 different projects, but then I looked at six projects in detail. and um, they range in size from sort of Apache to like Linux and, and GNOME, um, all large successful projects that are, you know, uh, the first four are sort of infrastructure and the last two are sort of an ecosystem of, of projects, which include sort of end user stuff. Uh, I have a variety of, of like, uh, these are the number of threads, like message discussion threads and the number of each style of, of review and the number of commits over that particular time period that I studied. Um, I started with Apache just because it was relatively small and had relatively well formalized um, processes and then moved to Subversion, which was in some ways a literal replication of my first case study because it was very similar to Apache. So if I didn't see similar stuff going on, then I probably wasn't you know, capturing the, the right phenomenon. And then went up to Linux, which is much bigger and uh, you know, it has a dictator as opposed to this sort of this community, right? And then finally to these, these, these uh, ecosystem style projects. So I'm just going to give you my sort of theory of, of open source peer review. So what I found from all my research, and then I'll present sort of each, how each of these pieces come sort of into it. So what I found is that the way it's done in open source is you have early frequent reviews. So that's really, they're just reviewing basically all the time of very small chunks of code. Um, and these chunks of code have to be independent and complete. So you can't have, like you can't 
be doing like a bug fix and re-indenting a whole bunch of unrelated files. They'll just be like, no, sorry, give us the bug fix and give us the indentation in two separate patches. So they have to be sort of logically and functionally independent as much as possible and as small as possible. Um, and it's done asynchronously, so it's broadcast to this mailing list. And so there's a potentially really large group of stakeholders in the hundreds or thousands. But what we actually see is that only a small group of, of self-selecting experts actually end up finding and doing, or actually end up commenting on the different patches. And um, I show that it's within certain bounds efficient and effective. So this is the first part where I actually quantify um, stuff. These are the, the sort of questions as well as the measures that I, that I look at. So the first thing was uh, review frequency and project activity. So um, as, the, as there's more development being done, does the reviewing actually keep up with it, or do we start to see a lot um, uh, less reviewed code? Because you know, in, in many cases, there, there, there are volunteer developers, and, and so do we start to, start to see this increased development but not uh, increased uh, reviews? Uh, how many people are actually participating? So are we talking about thousands of people in a particular review, or is it actually more like what we see in industry with like a couple people, four people maybe? Um, Experience and expertise, so how, who, who are the people that are doing this? Is it, are they working in their area, and do they ha have they been there for a long time, or is it, are you getting sort of more outsider opinions? Who are the people, what is the experience and expertise of those people? Um, then the size of the change, which I, um, so traditionally you're looking at big changes, or are we, we're looking at sort of smaller ones here. And then the complexity of the change under review, so how does this, uh, how does the complexity affect the, the review? And I, I have sort of two outcome or um, dependent variables, which are the review interval and the number of issues found. And traditionally, these have been measured as the, the efficiency of the review process and the effectiveness in, in sort of uh, traditional inspection experiments. So the review interval basically says, from the time the author says, I have this piece of code that I want you to review, to the time when all the bugs and defects have been reviewed, that sort of is the calendar time or the review interval. Um, so it doesn't tell you exactly how long any particular individual spent, but it's the entire time for the review. And that's usually on the order of, of weeks in, in uh, traditional inspections. And then just the number of defects found. So are we actually uncovering uh, defects? And um, I look at issues as opposed to defects, which I'll get to a bit later just because the developers don't record this was a defect, that was a defect. So I had to think of some other way of measuring that. So the first thing is... Uh, actually, sorry, before I go on, so I, I used the, these parameters in my models of, of efficiency and effectiveness, and I'm, as I go through, I'm just going to talk about you know, what influence they had when I do each, each parameter. So uh, frequency, this is a graph of FreeBSD, and you can see that the, this is sort of each point is a month, and you can see that, you know, in like sort of the relatively, like the 2000s or whatever, we're up in thousands of commits a month, right? And then for, for commit them review, we can see there's about um, like 10 times less uh, reviews. And this means about like one in 10. So the, one of the problems with the, the data that I have is if there's no problem found, I can't differentiate between whether it was ignored or whether it was reviewed with no issues found, right? But what, what I found when I actually went through manually and looked at them is they, they typically don't respond if there's nothing to talk about, right? And so you can see that about one in 10 um, reviews kind of bring up an issue, right? Um, the correlation between the number of commits, so project activity, and the number of commit them reviews uh, is around, is above 0.8 in, across all the projects. So as, 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 activity increases, so too does the, the, the frequency of review. Um, with review then commit, which is, which is, it's not committed, first you say, can you review this, and then it's later committed. The correlation is much smaller, so it's, it's moderate, somewhere between like 0.3 and 0.6. And um, I'm not exactly sure what the reason for this is, but a lot of those patches are rejected. So this is usually coming from outside people, and so, you know, these are conservative projects. They're not necessarily interested in your latest feature. And so it seems like they have, they're much less responsive to sort of these outsider patches as opposed to they do pay attention to the ones that are committed because this is what is affecting the system. Do you think maybe a, 
to explore correlating with like a time lag. Yeah, I did. I did to review before commit. You may expect that it's like doesn't show up till the next month or something, right? I did do auto correlations, but as we'll see, the the free, the, the the length of these reviews is really fast. We're talking like on the order of hours to days, and so it's really difficult to oh. choose the leg. Like it's basically this. It's still within the month. It, It'll be within like a few days usually, so yeah. <clears throat> so um, yeah, you can see that there's a high frequency. So these people are sort of constantly reviewing stuff. Um, so the next thing is, is participation. So as I've said, the sort of the, 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 the group of people who have commented on the mailing list is, is in the thousands, right? Um, the, the, the problem with the data that I have is that, you know, in a traditional inspection experiment, you have, oh, well, four people came to the inspection meeting. That's the participation. These three people talked, and that person didn't do anything. Whereas I don't really have that information. I just have this email list thread, and I have you know, the patch, and then people respond to it, right? Um, so, I only ha so if someone has you know, reviewed it, but they only found the same problem as someone else, they're not going to respond, right? So I only know the people who actively participated. I don't know all the people who... Um, maybe did the actual review. So what I did is I took all the reviews for a particular month and I said, if you respond at some point, if you're doing reviews, at some point you're going to be the first problem, person to find a problem and you're going to respond. And if you don't, you're really not contributing that much to the project. So I said, that's the review group. That's the group of people who are participating in reviews. And that's what this is. And you can see it's highly tied to the size of the project. So this number 16 here is for Apache. There's the, the size of the people who are participating in any given month is 16. Whereas for Linux, it's around 480. And very few of these people participate in more than one review. And the people who do are the core people, the maintainers of the project usually. Those are the people who participate in a number of reviews, so like five or six reviews versus just one review where they just had a single comment. So the review group is highly tied to the size of the project. But the number of reviewers for any review is, is almost constant in the median case across all the projects at two, right? And so you have this really big potential group. You have a, a smaller review group and a really small number of people in any individual review. All right. Um, the experience and the expertise of the people involved. Um, so this is uh, in days. We can see the author and reviewer. The authors have less experience than the reviewers. So some are between a year and just over three years um, uh, is how long they've typically been with the project. So the way that I measured this is I said, OK, at some point you have a commit or a first message. And then we have the current review. At this current review, how long has the person been with the project? right? So um, the reviewers have been sort of like a, a couple years to, to many years with the project. And um, the, the commit than review, had, the people had a lot more experience than review than commit. And again, this makes sense. If, you, if, you, if you're involved in the commit than review process, you're either watching the commit mailing list or you have commit privileges. And so probably you have more experience. But, I mean, even in the review then commit case, we're talking about usually somewhere around a year of experience before you're really typically involved in, in, these, in these things. Um, experience, experience. This should say expertise. But um, I looked at the amount of work that you were doing, so just the number of commits and reviews that you were involved in, and uh, the area of work, so what files you were changing. And uh, these correlated relatively highly, so I just kept the simpler one, which was the um, amount of work, so the number of commits. And uh, in both cases, the experience and expertise. So in, in the interval case, the more experience and expertise actually reduce the interval. So the greater the experience, the shorter the <laughs> interval. Uh, I'm not totally sure why. And then in the case of the number of issues found, the more experience you had as a reviewer, the, the more issues that were found. And it was always the reviewer that sort of dominated the influence of experience. So the author was less. So who could be for both author and reviewer? Yes, sorry, I should have specified that. So the author, the authors kind of varied more in experience, and theirs was less important in terms of the interval and the number of issues found than the experience of the reviewer. 
So the next thing is, is patch size. And a number of people have looked at, at the size of, of patches in open source. And, and uh, I think it was Audris was like, they're a lot smaller than they are in industry usually. And, and we can see that um, for Apache, Apache, which has like the sort of smallest patch size, we're talking somewhere around 17 lines of change code. So I'm talking, if you have a diff, you have the plus and the minus of lines change. I just summed them together, so added and removed. Um, uh, so we're talking like 17 lines with Apache, and then uh, Linux, I think, is the highest, it's somewhere around 35 lines. But I mean, these are relatively small changes when you compare them to the hundreds of lines that, say, Lucent was doing during reviews. Um, so again, we're seeing really fast reviews of really small things, basically, or really frequent reviews of really small things. So they're constantly reviewing little things, right? Um, and also, although we have this big group of people, it's usually these people with relatively large expertise, a small group of them actually performing the reviews, even though there is a potential for a large group of people. So the next thing I looked at was complexity. And most complexity measures just measured the system complexity, which is different from the change complexity. Um, so you might have a very complex piece of code that you've just changed one line, which is a highly complex change. But you might also change like many, many different files in a very simple manner, but understanding the interactions between all those files is as well a complex change. So the first thing that we looked at was churn, which is just the number of lines changed. Uh, and then the number of files modified. So this correlated with churn around 0. 0.6, so a moderate correlation. The number of diffs, so this is usually like the, if you post a diff and then the, the reviewer says, well, what about this? And you post another one, those tended, uh, that, that correlated only around 0.25 with churn and, and files. So these, these three are, are you know, relatively independent. I looked at change blocks. So in a diff, you have like this part of the file changed, and then maybe 100 lines later, this part of the file changed. So we looked at the number of hunks. So the, the further apart in the file, I assume, would be more complex than if you changed two hunks that are relatively close together, and the number of hunks. And this correlated relatively highly with churn around 0.8. So I, d I dropped it because churn is an easier, an easier thing to use. Uh, directory distance. So if you have usually the, often the directory structure indicates kind of the architecture of the system. So if you have two files in the same directory that you change, that's probably a less complex change than if you change one file here and one file way over here. Again, this correlated, um, actually this correlated uh, around 0.87 with uh, the, number of file, uh, the number of files. So I, I dropped that one, um, again, because it's more difficult. Uh, it was just the, the average. Uh, yeah, 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 just the average. Um, and then the depth of indentation, which is Abram Hindle actually looked at this. So the more, basically, the more white space you have before a line, the more likely it's involved in some deep, complex conditional or something like that. So it's going to be more complex. But again, this correlated highly with churn, which all complexity measures seem to correlate with the size of the file. So um, I kept these three in my models. And um, as you might expect, the more complex, the longer the interval, and the more complex, the more issues found in the code. Um, yeah. So the last thing, and probably one of the more interesting things is, is in terms of the measures, actually, uh, is the review interval. And so this is how long are the reviews actually taking. And um, we can see that you know, in the median case here, we're talking um, a few hours. Um, and so actually, sorry, I have two things here. I have the time for, to the first response. So when you post the patch, how long does it take until someone's done a review and, and responded and said, what about this? right? And this is important if you're talking about commit the review, right? Because if I commit something and it's not until two weeks later that someone actually notices that I have an issue, then it's going to, you know, potentially there's going to be dependencies on it. Whereas what we're seeing here with commit the review, the, the interval, so the first response, is within a few hours and within a day or just over a day in, in, at the 90th percentile. So. The first response is happening really fast within a few hours. And the full interval, which is this sort of darker line here, um, again, is also happening with between a few hours and one to two days. So the, the, chain, the reviews happen really fast, and the interval is also actually really short. And this is, so you have really fast feedback, which is, again, facilitated by having really small changes, 
kind of doing co-development together, um, allowing people to select what they're interested in, what they know, and this kind of what stuff. What do you attribute this to? The, what do I attribute it to? Well, what, what's motivating these people to respond so quickly? Is it the culture of, of open source development process? That's actually the sort of the second part where I look more qualitatively. So you have these numbers, like, so I kind of, I'll just postpone that, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so basically we see that there are these really fast responses, right? And it's a really short interval. And clearly it's, that was one of the things, that, like, what Audra said, he's like, well, the patches are much smaller in open source than industry, but we have no idea why. And I think part of it is you have to review these really small things all the time, and that's what they're doing. It's, it started off with the volunteer culture of, well, I don't have that much time to look at this, right? So um, I think it evolved kind of out of that. The, the number of issues, um, uh, the models that I have range, so I actually have uh, 10 models for, because there's two types of review for four projects. So there's 10 models for interval, and the R squared value ranges from, um, uh, 0.2 to 0.48, I think. So a reasonable uh, explanation of the variance. With the number of issues, it ranges from, uh, well, I, I didn't even bother interpreting the ones below 0.2, but 0.2 to 0.58. So again, reasonable explanation of the variance. Uh, measuring the number of issues was a little bit difficult. Uh, initially, I just did it manually. But what I realized, basically what happens is, they post the patch to the mailing list, and people say, okay, you have you know, this stuff, but then they just break in, they just respond, right? Like this is just the respond, when you respond, you get the little things. And it says, what happens if you know, we have this particular thing happening here, right? And so this is sort of, you, you just break the code with your responses, so it's kind of interleaved, and you also cut out any crap you're not interested in talking about. And so you have, basically what I did is I just took the diff, and I said, anytime there's a break like this, there's some issue being discussed. So I can't say that it's a true defect or anything like that because they don't record that information. And when I tried to do it, I was reading it over, and I'm not smart enough to understand the internals of Apache or Linux or anything like that. So it's a little bit outside of what I could do, but I tried to count the number of issues. And again, they're really small patches, and you see between one and two issues per sort of contribution. So you do it in I did it in automate. I started doing it manually, and then I'm like, all I'm really doing is counting the number of breaks, basically, right? Uh, you can't, I, like, I can only, you can only do it if there's a diff, right? Like, I didn't, like, if someone responds to this, it's not a new issue, they're still talking about the same issue, right? So it was only on the initial patch that was produced. I didn't, because otherwise you just end up, basically the number of issues is identical to the number of responses, which is totally useless, right? <coughs> and not, not valid. So that's, the, that's sort of the more quantitative stuff. Um, but then I didn't really understand, you know, as, as you asked, like how, how, why do they decide to do the review? How do they find these things? Why is it so fast? Why do we, instead of having hundreds of people talking in the meeting case, just two people? So the research questions that I came up with um, is, first of all, how do they find the patches within this sort of broadcast of information? Um, then uh, what happens when patches are ignored? So, so far I haven't really looked at that. I said, I'm only gonna look at stuff that gets a response because I know if there's a response, they're talking about something. If it's ignored, I don't know whether it was just no defects found or, um, or it was just not committed, right? And you actually looked a little bit at whether um, stuff gets in, kind of. Uh, so ignored patches, what happens when patches are ignored? Um, then when the actual review happens, who are the stakeholders, how do they interact? And when there's too many stakeholders, how do they avoid sort of deadlocking? And also uh, scalability issues. So while broadcasting might work wonderfully for Apache, which is a relatively like a medium-sized project, it might not scale up to something like KDE or Linux or something like that, the techniques that they use. So how do they do these, how do they scale up? So I used uh, grounded theory, which is a qualitative research methodology, and I coded 500 instances of review threads across the different projects. Um, I also interviewed 10 core developers to sort of triangulate my findings to make sure that what I was seeing was not some, to make sure that I wasn't crazy. So the way that I coded it is I basically had um, the, the, the review thread, and then I would, just write, I would just write what I was seeing and then abstract that into sort of these larger themes, and then ultimately you end up with uh, sort of your core or most important themes.
So the first thing, finding reviews in a broadcast. Um, <clears throat> so the big thing here was um, this idea of area of interest and obligation. So typically in open source, when you start doing development, you're interested in a particular part of the system. You write some code. As you become sort of successful at writing code in that area, you are invited to you know, be a maintainer of that area or to become a core developer. And at that point, you start, the developers that I interview start saying, talking about obligation. Like, when I see code in that area, I'm going to review it. And this isn't purely altruistic. If I'm maintaining a particular area of the code and someone else changes it, I'm going to have to later probably maintain that code. So I have a vested interest in making sure that this review is a good review, right? And, 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 um, uh, so yeah, and, and yeah, ensuring that that's sort of a, a, good, uh, a good section of code. So in traditional inspection, it's like, you know, you three are reviewing this, right? You don't necessarily have a vested interest in what is under review. So you're not necessarily as actively involved in, in the review process. So um, how did they actually pull? Like, so in the case of Linux, the Linux kernel mailing list has a median of 340 messages a day. That's a lot of mail. So I asked, how do you sort of dig through this and actually find what you're interested in? How do you not become overwhelmed? And so the first thing is they just had simple mail filters. So, uh, well, some of them are actually more complicated. One of the more interesting ones was one of the maintainers for Linux. He said, I just, I, I have all the files for my particular part of the system, and I just have a filter that if there's a diff with one of those files, it just pulls it out into my inbox, right? So all the developers differentiated between the general mailing list traffic and their inbox. So if someone sent something directly to them as well as the mailing list, they paid more attention to it than just the mailing list. And they also had these filters that would pull out, you know, if it came from a particular person that they usually work with or um, files or whatever. So they pulled out the sort of important email to limit what, um, what they had to look at. And then the next, next thing is this idea of what I call progressive details. So they did still look on a regular basis at the entire mailing list, right? Um, and the reason that this is possible is because uh, if we actually go, hopefully this will come up. I did it in an off, offline. Anyways, we'll see if that comes up. I, you, you have all these subjects that describe what the patch is about in one line. So you can go and kind of read all this stuff. And this allows you to sort of develop a general awareness See if I click work offline. Sorry. This allows you to develop a, a general awareness of what other people are working on. So one of the guys talked about how. Um, how like. He, he pays attention to all, he, one of the subversion developers says, you know, I pay attention to all the commits that are going on. I don't understand them at the nitty gritty detail levels, but I have a general awareness of what everyone else is doing on the entire project. And I get this just by following the commit subjects and by following the discussion, the subjects that, that's going on. So what happens is you, I'm not sure if you can see that, you have the subject that basically says in one line, this is what the patch is about, right? So you can say, as you're skimming over the subject, you say, oh, well, I know something about that. So you click on it, or I'm interested in that. And then you have the change log, which basically says, you know, these, this is what the patch does at an abstract level. This is why I decided to do it this way. This person also approved it. This is maybe something I don't understand, and I would like some feedback on this particular aspect of it. Um, you know, these are other people who are involved in it, right? And so as a reviewer, you come in and you say, okay, well, I don't really agree at a conceptual level with what this person's doing, and so I'm just going to talk at that. I'm not even going to bother looking at their code because there's no point, right? And then if, you get, if you're like, okay, no, that makes sense, then you get to the last part, which is the actual code, and you can discuss sort of the details of it, right? So it's this progressively adding more detail that I think that I sort of hypothesize allows them to deal efficiently with what would otherwise be an overwhelming quantity of information. <clears throat> there there we go. Uh, so that's the so the next thing is this interleaved history. So 
when I, in my example up here, as you can see, the discussion is interleaved with the, um, the actual patch itself. And you know, if someone, when the author responds to this, or this question down here, they say, well, you know, I was doing such and such, and that's why I did it this way. And so you start to see these sub sort of points of, of discussion being developed. And someone who is coming in from the outside, so you know, I haven't been paying any attention to this review, but I see there's been a lot of discussion, maybe I'll look at it. You have the whole history of the entire discussion broken out into these sort of subtopics within the actual thread. And anything you're not interested in, you're supposed to cut. So you can see, like, he's just cut off the top part that he's not interested in talking about, right? So this is this interleaved history. The last part of, of, of sort of finding is, is refinding reviews. So if, if once I sort of have found something that I'm interested in, a patch that I'm interested in, it'd be really inefficient if I had to refine that within the general broadcast every single time there was a new discussion point made, right? And what happens in, in private email when I send, if I send three people an email and they respond is if they don't add anyone new explicitly, it's going to be the same people. Whereas on a mailing list, I send it just generally out. I don't send it to anyone explicitly, although I could. But when I respond to that, I'm added to the CC list. And developers differentiate between the general list and what's sent to them specifically. So now I get all subsequent discussion in my inbox. So I don't have to sort of refine this in the general barrage of discussion. It just comes directly to me. Um, so it's, it's, just a, it's just a natural kind of property of, of, of mailing lists that allows them to easily refine what they've been talking about. Uh, so the next point, so that's how do they find stuff. The next point is what happens when there's too few reviewers. So um, ask them, like, everyone has time pressures. It's slightly different in open source. Instead of saying, you have to review these five things, it's like, well, I only have this amount of time to work on it. So instead of saying, I'm going to rush through and review all these five, I'm going to say, well, this is the number one priority for me, and I'm going to review this properly. And that's what they all said. They said, you know, I don't, I don't rush through reviews. I will postpone stuff rather than rushing through it. And, and it's perhaps a cultural thing. They're not being forced to a particular deadline usually. But that was the mentality, the definite mentality. Um, this is, is interesting, too. Um, in the sense that it pushes the effort of ensuring that a patch gets in off the expert and onto the author who is potentially less expert. So I say, you know, sorry, I don't have time to look at this now. Can you send it to me next week? It's no longer the reviewer's responsibility to remember I have to review that. So the author will resend it. And if at that point it's interesting to me as the reviewer, then I will review it. So uh, instead of being forced by a manager to review stuff, they review what they're interested in. And potentially, they know people who are not competent or capable just get ignored. And you're not forced to review these people who you're like, this is wasting my time. You just, you just ignore them. If no one's interested in a change, does that mean that like, there are just so, then no one reviews it and it doesn't go in? Typically, yeah, like that's so just that's language and die because no one cares. Then no one cares, and I, I mean it's it's a bit of a, like an elitist problem, but it's a slightly different problem than what like at least the people are interested and active in in what is interesting, right? And it's this it's this selection sort of almost naturalish selection of what is interesting and what is useful over just what I have to do. <clears throat> So the actual review discussions, the, the interviewees and sort of what I actually saw as well, can be broken sort of into two categories. The purely technical discussions, and in this case usually it's accepted and understood that, um, that the, 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 the code is, is necessary and useful, but it's just like going through and, and, you know, well this is obviously poor code and reject it, or, you know, you've made this little problem. But in, in, the, in the other case, it's, it's the scope or politics kind of discussions that n none of the developers like. They all tried to avoid these kinds of things, right? So someone will come on and say, why didn't you write it this way? Or, or we really need this feature. Um, and these often end up being like a really over-specialized fix. So you know, I optimized the, the kernel in this particular way. And it's like, well, that screws over our, like 99% of our users. So go away, please. You know, you can maintain this yourself. We don't mind, but we're not going to include it. And you end up in this, this political discussion. One of the interesting things is, especially in these uh, conservative mature projects, is if there's no obvious significant improvement, it doesn't get in. So you'll actually see Linus Torvalds, he'll be like, well, 
I don't see the performance numbers being that much better. Sure, the code's a bit cleaned up, but it's not hasn't been tested well enough, so it gets rejected. So there's nothing really wrong with it. It's just they keep what they know works over what doesn't work because Again, I was looking at mature, relatively stable projects. So it might be different on sort of smaller, newer projects. Does that mean they don't do much code refactoring or cleaning? Um, or does that, are they able to quantify that as a significant yeah, I, I, I think you could do that. You could definitely do that. But you have to show that there's obvious benefits, right? So it has to be clear to the person who's doing the reviewing that there are these benefits and you have to argue them. And if you aren't able to do that, and you the other thing is, sure, you can do a whole bunch of code refactoring. That's fine, wonderful. But if it hasn't been tested, it's not going to get in. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to take it. At this time, we're not willing to take it. Go find a whole bunch of people to test this on their machines and come back and tell us, right? And then maybe we'll accept it. But as it stands, there's no ob it's not obviously better. And so we're not going to take it. So there's no, so basically, it's not the testing is totally distributed then? Yeah, exactly. I mean, in the sense that, that you're, but I guess what's the bar for testing? I mean, they do their own testing once they accept the patch. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it kind of varies depending on the trust of the person who's written the code, uh, how important it is, if you have obvious benchmarks that can show performance. Like, there's definitely a lot of, um, like case specific stuff that will determine whether it's better or not. But at the end, one of the reviewers, one of the maintainers will decide whether it's, it's, it's better or not, right? Um, and, and I mean, I think it was Linus in one of the, his, I think he did a tech talk at Google. He talked about how testing's for wussies or something like he would say. And he's like, whenever I write code, I just hand it back down to one of the maintainers or whatever, and then if it gets tested, if it makes it back up, fine. If it gets dropped, I don't care. You know, it's, it has to go, even stuff that I write has to go sort of through this process of making sure that it does get sort of run by a bunch of different people and, and tested in that sort of loose. What's he saying about isn't testing? I mean, that no, he says, I don't do testing. Oh. I pass it back down to people yeah, like my maintainers and, and like other users and that kind of stuff. And if the code that I've written makes it back up to me again, then I'll include it. But if it doesn't, I don't care. Because it, it just didn't sort of satisfy this criteria of being like That's better, faster. yeah, a significant improvement, right? Uh, one of the things that they did point out to me though is like it doesn't stop new features. Like they will change. Like like we realize this is the direction we need to go, and these are the stepping stones that we're going on. But then it's sort of we've planned for this. Like this is the direction that we're moving in, and you know maybe it's going to get a little worse for a little while, but we know this is where we're going, right? So it doesn't stop significant new features, but if you're just rewriting something because you think it's going to be faster and it turns out to only be like, min like a minuscule amount faster, then it just doesn't get included. Um, so when I asked them about roles, um, I, I didn't see any explicit roles, and they didn't really, they were like roles, like there's not really, like there's no like reader or moderator. These people do kind of come up, but they don't uh, just sort of naturally exist. And so uh, these were the sort of personas or ways that they acted. So the objective analyzer, which is kind of the goal of peer review, you're objectively looking at the code, finding bugs. This is sort of the mentor role as new people are coming on. Uh, as I talked about, you have to generate interest around your patch in order for it to get accepted. Um, and then just like, we've already talked about this, go away. Kind of just grumpy cynic. We've already tried this. We've been down this road. Go read that discussion and leave us alone. Uh, and then this is kind of the resign where you're like, OK, I don't care. Just make a decision. I don't care which decision it is. They're all fine kind of thing, which is the bike shed effect, which I'm going to get to next. Uh, in terms of outsiders, um, for the most part, they said outsiders, the core reviewers were like, the outsiders, they had sort of mixed opinions about them. Uh, so long as they're competent and objective and they're not sort of have a particular ideology that they're not willing to leave, they can actually be quite useful. So the different types of useful ones, which are sort of the rare outsiders, are aspiring developers. Uh, external developers, so um, that you know, you're writing a, an infrastructure project, so like Apache, and then there's a bunch of modules around it. So they're writing their own code, and they realize there's a bug that's related to the code that they're working on. And they'll actually sometimes correct it for you in your product and then give you a particular piece of code. And then power users, um, 
one of the subversion guys said, you know, we have these sites that run huge subversion repositories and they bring up issues that are outside of the scope of the core development team, right? So they're useful in terms of discussing what is necessarily, what needs to be in the product, right? And sort of giving more, a broader perspective to the development team. So the too many opinions, I wanted to measure uh, Parkinson's law of triviality, which is uh, trivial stuff gets discussed to death. And one of the things that, they, what, that, that is noticeable in one of these uh, discussion threads is that usually there's not a lot of core developers. There's a lot of outsiders making noise. So I said, how, influ how often does this actually happen in review? Um, so the number of uh, review threads that, are involved, that involve at least one outsider, you can see that outsiders are involved in a reasonable number of threads. However, they're rarely the majority of people. So most of the time, it's the core developers who are, who are in the majority. Um, in terms of how much, uh, so the more, the, the more, the, the larger the number of outsiders, the, the, the shorter the time to review, um, the fewer total messages, and the fewer core developer messages. So kind of basically something similar to what you found is that the higher your status, the more likely people are to talk to you. And so the outsiders really, although they're involved, they're not sort of dominating the reviews and ending up in these sort of pointless, trivial discussions for the most part. And that resonated with, um, with the people that I interviewed as well. Kind of getting a little low on time, but uh, um, this last part is sort of the scaling issues. So we can see that Apache, this is the number of messages per day along the, the top axis logged. And you can see that Apache is around 30, 40 messages. Whereas Linux down here, it, it, this is the median number of messages a day, is around 340 messages. This is a single mailing list. Um, K, FreeBSD, KDE, and GNOME had 90, 130, and 200, 200 different mailing lists, right? So topic-specific mailing lists. And when you sum them all together, they're relatively similar to Apache, so around, or Linux, so around 200. But the top individual list was actually really small, so around the size of Apache, right? So this is the first way that they kind of dealt with scale, is by sort of chunking stuff into these different mailing lists. So you subscribe to a subset of what you're actually interested in. Um, the, the concern that I had here is, well, this kind of isn't broadcasting anymore. You've isolated these people into little groups, and now you're not getting this sort of outsider input anymore, right? Um, few, so I looked at how many messages cross-cut various lists. So if you were to send to multiple lists, then you would, again, be kind of including a larger population. But very few messages and uh, email threads actually cross-cut multiple lists. What ends up happening is that many individuals are subscribed to many lists, and they kind of bridge the lists together. So they, they're aware of what's happening here, they're aware of what's happening there, and they discuss the, the different points. So they're on uh, many different lists. So the guys that I interviewed were subscribed to somewhere between 5 and 30 different mailing lists. Um, I, 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 I thought you know, the people who are probably bridging the community so are, that are on the most lists are probably the higher status developers, so the ones doing the most committing. Um, this was only a moderate correlation, so it's not completely one-to-one. -one. So I guess probably what the problem here is that you probably have developers who are just really focused and do a lot of committing and have no interest in anything else, right? So I, it would be interesting to look at who are the people who are doing the bridging? What is their sort of, what, what's their makeup, right? Because it's not just completely related to your development status in the team. Um, the next thing is, uh, so Linux, didn't, didn't, doesn't bother. It does have multiple lists, but the LKML list is huge. It's massive. It's bigger than like the 200 GNOME lists. It has 350 messages or 400 messages a day. Um, so I was like, this, what is happening here? And what I noticed was that um, messages sent to the Linux kernel mailing list were sent to the mailing list, but they also usually had, um, well, they had people that were also CC'd, so individuals that were CC'd. So they were broadcasting stuff, but they were also saying, you might want to look at this as well, right? So they were sending it directly to particular people. So I said, well, is this basically, what is, what's going on here? Is it, is, has the broadcast basically broken down and we're sending it to particular people? Or do people who are, don't explicitly receive this also respond? So this is the requested. So 
a, a message has, uh, in the median case, around four people that it's actually explicitly targeting. The number of people who are explicitly target, targeted that um, respond, uh, oh sorry, this is plus one. I was wondering why that was like that, because I couldn't log zero, so it's out of one. So it's, it's uh, around four. So the number of people who, ex who are explicitly requested, so it came to my inbox, in the median case around one person responds. But the number of people who implicitly respond, so I didn't actually receive this, but I still found it interesting and respond, was again around one for a total of uh, two people, two reviewers that actually responded. So basically they've combined, the, combined this idea of broadcasting with tar uh, specifically targeting people. Uh, I don't really have a lot of time, I guess, for this part, but um, although like formal inspection kind of is, is quite different from open source review, a lot of the, the findings around um, around sort of the advances in inspection uh, are very similar to what a lot of the open source developers are doing, right? So uh, Voda and Porter and those guys found synchronous meetings don't discover more defects. So you can do you can do, uh, it's basically that preparation phase, you, that's where you find all the defects. So why he found, you know, 20% of the interval, so the weeks spent doing the, the, the calendar time was just wasted waiting for people to meet, basically. So do asynchronous meetings is what they found. Um, there's a lot of other things that you can get out of doing peer review that you don't when you restrict the goal to solely finding defects. So in the open source thing we saw like mentoring, you can bring new people onto the team, this kind of stuff. This also happens relatively easily in an asynchronous environment. Um, two, two reviewers typically find as many as four. So they found that by adding more people, you weren't finding significantly more defects. And the number that they came up with was two, which is naturally what open source gravitates towards. In the median case, there's two sort of people who, who are involved. Either obviously can be as many as you want in some cases. Is, is that like Eyeballs are bugs, all bugs are shallow because apparently more eyeballs doesn't equal more, more bugs. Um, I'm not, uh, it's, it's, it's fine, it's what it actually is, the, the best predictor of the number of defects found that, that like Porter and those guys found was the uh, expertise. So the expertise is the best predictor, right? So having competent eyeballs is much more important than lots of eyeballs. At least in, in the, that's what they found, right? And one of the nice, like in open source, there are some reviews that have 20 people involved, right? And so you're not restricted to only two people. It's just two people tend to. You also interpret that as because they're small changes, you have more people involved in the reviewing process. That's not only a certain set pipe up and say something. That's actually an interesting point. What, what I think is because so if you have a really large artifact, you're going to need expertise from a variety of places. Whereas if you keep the artifact really small, you don't necessarily, you need, the, the, the people who have the expertise don't necessarily need to communicate with each other. And so they just review the small chunk that they're interested in, right? Um, and it's this idea of self-selection. So as I say, you're reviewing this. It's just like, this is something that I have that I would like someone to look at. And it's like, well, I know something about that, right? So it's really optimizing that idea of let's get the right expert on it, right? Um, which, is, which was shown to be the best predictor of, uh, of things. And the large, large artifacts are simply just difficult to review. Like it, you divide stuff and you conquer it, right? Um, and by having sort of co-developers in an area, you have people who understand it. So the preparation time is basically nil. It's like, I understand this part of the system. All I need to know now is what you've changed, right? So the, the preparation time is, is almost zero. And my Pardis and, and uh, Masili, they, they, they have this idea of active reviews because they were noticing people were just not involved and active enough in the review process. But Open source kind of takes it to, well, we're co-developers. I, I, I don't necessarily own this, but I'm interested. I have a vested interest in making sure this is a good review. So it's kind of beyond almost active, and it's invested. Um, agile, these are just, there's, agile and open source are, are pretty similar. Uh, but the big thing here is uh, distance and scale, right? So um, agile sort of depends on this sort of osmotic communication, right? So you have everyone in a small room, and you kind of hear in the background what people are talking about and, and you pipe up when you know something potentially, right? Or you just tune stuff out. 
Um, so I think, I think this idea of, of broadcasting and using the mailing list could help Agile actually scale to a larger thing. Because I mean, it, it is osmotic communication, right? You have the, all these subjects and you're peripherally aware of what's going on. You know what other people are working on. You pipe up when you know stuff, right? But it does work in these hugely distributed large projects, right? Which Agile has difficulties uh, scaling up to. So uh, in summary, this is kind of the, the main sort of points that I found. So, Early frequent reviews, which gives you lots of feedback early on, of small independent complete chunks to sort of divide and conquer stuff. Asynchronously, the meetings really don't help. Uh, synchronous meetings aren't necessary. Uh, you have this potentially large group, but what you end up with is people self-selecting, and you end up with a small group of, of actual core reviewers. And it does find defects, and it does happen pretty fast. So that's it. Any questions for Peter? Cool. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Thanks to the speaker. Thanks for coming.